Hey everyone, welcome to the first episode of How I Got Through It. This has been a dream of mine to have conversations with guests about just the difficult things in life that we all go through. For my first episode, I chose my friend, producer, and actress, Melanie Chandra. You've probably seen her in Parenthood, Rules of Engagement, or Brown Nation, but I believe that she's best known for her work as Maliala on CBS's Code Black and Farida on HBO's The Brink. What I love about Melanie is from the first day that we met, I quickly realized that she has this deep-seated passion for bringing more empathy into this world through her work and all of her platforms. In this episode, we discuss how to make life decisions, what she believes is faith versus confidence, and Melanie shares this impactful story of turning her TV on one day and seeing another actress being successful in a lead role that she actually gave up. Let's get right into the conversation and welcome to the first episode of How I Got Through It. Melanie, thank you so much for being here with us. As you know, this podcast is a space where I ask my guests to bring a life thing that they've been through and we take a deeper look at it. We see how you navigated that situation emotions that you felt, lessons that you learned, decisions that were made. So what is the life thing that you're bringing to the table today? It was a gut punch about a year ago when I turned on the television and I saw somebody else living up my dreams. So (laughs) just some context. A few years ago, I was a new mom in New York and I was up for a role on an up-and-coming TV series for a great streaming platform with an incredible creative team. And it was one of the lead roles in the series. And I said no to it. I didn't have the offer in my hands. I'll be very clear about that. But it was the final round in the casting process. Mm -hmm. And at that point, there was only maybe two or three girls in contention for this. But before you say yes to walking into that final round, you have to negotiate your contract for seven years. It's just this crazy, it's a crazy way TV series works. Before you even audition for the final, final piece of it, you have to lay out what your terms are going to be for the next seven years of your life. Where are you going to be? The salary, the rights and options and all of that. So I ultimately said no. And there were many, many factors involved and, you know, the guidance of my management team, talking with mentors and all of that. And one piece of my decision-making process was the fact that I was a new mom and taking on this role could potentially disrupt the life I currently had and relocating my family for a portion of the year or, you know, for the next seven years of my life. And... Fast forward, I'm now pregnant, not right this second, but almost a year ago, I was pregnant with my second child, very nauseous, sitting in my sweats, um, eating ramen because it was the only type of food I could actually keep down at the time. And the TV show that I did not go for is airing, and it's amazing. It is a really, really good show, and I see this girl who's phenomenal. She seems really, really lovely, and I'm happy for her. But a part of me just was crushed inside, and I started to think, what if? Did I make the right decision? At that moment, I was prior towards my family over career, but now the show is great, and this girl is an overnight success. It could have been me. And so that was something I had to deal with, and I think a lot of people that are thinking about family versus career are going through. And, yeah, so that was something I was faced with last year and also something that you know was brought to my attention again just a few months ago with another project of consideration so yeah i'd love to talk to you about this so let's go back to when you are sitting in your on your couch eating ramen watching (laughs) netflix and seeing this show that you could have been on or you decided consciously not to um, pursue I guess my question is, did you spiral into like 
anxiety or like, how did that kind of hit you? Cause it hits everyone differently. I got sad. Yeah. You know, I think I get to the root of the feeling right away. Of course there's anxiety and just disbelief or disappointment. Yeah. I think, I think disappointment was actually the core belief. I was just disappointed. Disappointment um, with yourself? By the process. Hmm. Yeah. Just by a lot of things. But I think fundamentally it's this, the role of women as the ones to bear children and whether or not you have to consider whether you can have both. Can you have your career at the highest level Mm -hmm. and can you have a family at the highest level and how you navigate that? And it's something that some men men go through, of course, you know, little auto men that do take on that nurturing role. Mm -hmm. But as a woman, especially, you know, being in front of the camera, it's, Sometimes it doesn't feel fair and I'm not trying to place the blame on anything or anyone, but I was just disappointed that I had to make that choice. And a lot of women have to choose one thing over and over, over another at a, you know, different phases of their life. But I mean, I think that's, that's universal. Right. And that's a great dynamic that actually you bring up because being the lead in a TV show is seemingly a peak or could be a peak of your career, but also having giving birth is also mm-hmm. your life, you know? Yeah. Um, really good moments in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're asked to choose one, which is as women, it is a choice that we have to make. So what were some of the things that you went through mentally to come up with that decision? Because at the time that you were Going into that like lo- final round of auditions, you didn't know you were going to be pregnant a year later. What were the defining, you know, factors or did you do a pro and con list? Like what, what was it for you? <laughs> I have a very analytical brain. At least that's it. That's the training I had growing up as a engineering student, but I also found really in touch with my intuition and my creativity over the last few years as I've been pursuing acting and all of that. And so I kind of made a pros and cons list, but I knew that wasn't really going to the seal the deal for me. I had to talk to a lot of people and trusted sources. So, of course, my whole management team, who I love and adore, and they've always guided me in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And so they had their, their piece of advice. Then I talked to my colleagues, my friends that were actors and working their way up as well. And they said the opposite, you know, the business side, the business people were saying, don't do it. My friends that were up and coming actors, they definitely do it. And then I had um, someone that I doesn't know, I call them my mentor, but I'm going to call him my mentor who's, who's an actor that's done. He's been on both sides of it as an executive, as well as a very successful actor. And he wrote, really helped me think through this. And he's like, why ultimately, why are you, what are, what are your reps? What are your, you know, talent managers saying, what are your friends saying? But why do you not want to do this? Hmm. Is it because of the family thing? Is it because of the opportunity cost? Is it because of money or compensation? Is it because of the type of character? And, you know, it was a combination of a lot of things. Ultimately, there were two things that were at play. One was a family component. So energetically, I wasn't all invested in it. I was really unsure what would happen. And two was I was coming from a place of lack in my career. It had been a few years since I had booked you know, a major TV series and, you know, I, you know, I was out of commission a little bit because of pregnancy and being a new mom. So I was like, I don't know when I'm going to get my next opportunity like this ever again. And he's like, I think you have your answer. You do not, you're coming from a place of lack versus knowing that there's something great coming for you in the future. And I thought about it and I was like, that's, 
that just felt right. It was a lead character. It wasn't the lead lead of the series. And there were definitely things that were not right about the full package of taking this opportunity. But after seeing the show, I'm like creatively, oh my gosh, this is, as an artist, this would have been so fulfilling and checked off so many boxes on that front, but it didn't check off all the boxes. But, you know, one thing was family and the other thing was coming from a place of lack. But it's a, it's a situation I face all the time. And now that I'm a mom of two, it's even, it's, always present with every audition or request for this. It's, I have to take into consideration everything. And I have many people I can call on to give me advice, but there's no consensus. So ultimately I've learned to listen to my intuition. That's incredible. I want to just hone in a little bit on the fact that you said you were coming from a place of lack. First of all, I think that is, you're very self-aware. A lot of people don't know even where they're coming from. What is running them? Is it an insecurity? Is it, what is it exactly? So I think that that, that was really a, probably a powerful moment. And I think also as women and men too, be being able to imagine something for your life that you haven't historically probably experienced yet is a very, very strange place to be in. It's like a rock and a hard place <laughs> because you want this so much, but you haven't experienced it before. And especially, I'm sure, as a brown, I'll just say a brown actress, which, I mean, mm-hmm. um, that, like, we don't, you don't see a lot of brown actresses on TV. And I think that's one of the things that, that drew me to you. I remember seeing it was a movie a very, a, quite a long time ago. And I was like, wow, she is like my skin color. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and then I looked you up and then, and then we worked on, on the Huff Post project together. And so, but I think that knowing where you're coming from and, and I applaud your mentor also for, for bringing that up. And I know that you have maybe had dealt with this a little, a little bit in your past when you decided to leave McKenzie and go into acting and pursue that. Was this the only time that you knew you were coming from a place of lack? Could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is, it's it's a very complicated issue, I would say, because someone who is starting their career, you're right. You don't have, you don't know what abundance is yet. (laughs) You can only try to manifest it. And so you're, you're eager and you're just hustling. I think that's the right word. You're knocking on doors. You're seeing who's going to answer. You're putting yourself out there for every opportunity. It's not from coming from a place of lack. I think at the beginning, you still have to believe in yourself. You're not, you shouldn't be lacking in conviction for yourself and where you want to be in your career. Mm-hmm. But it's this, eagerness and and passion for just putting yourself out there constantly and possibly facing rejection constantly (laughs) and possibly facing rejection and I think you know I got really fortunate early on in my career and then I had a lull and then with that lull I was missing the sense of I lost a little bit of confidence in, in what I was doing and my ability as an actor, my approach to the business. Is it because I'm too invested in my relationship or if I'm not happy? There was all these things I was searching for. But what troubled me in my career at that moment is I was feeling this sense of this need for approval. Mm-hmm. Wow, I haven't booked anything over for a really long time. Do people think I'm bad if I just have a great audition if I book something? I'll be back and people will believe in me and I'll feel good and confident again. And I realized, or looking back, being in that place is not what served me at all. And if anything, I think it reinforced old habits of not believing in myself and not doing my best. There was a sense of, there's a part of it was self-sabotage. I was feeling unworthy and I was relying on other people's opinions and, you know, booking the job or getting the right, right agent as a reflection of my worth. And what helped me get out of it at that time 
was moving on from people in the industry that I had relationships with that were making me feel that way. Mm-hmm. And two, I started a meditation practice as well that helped me realize, you know, what was really important to me and who I was at the core. And is that just those two things? And do you have other things in your arsenal that you use to kind of what I would say, get back into probably alignment or get back in line with your core needs, wants, principles? I think definitely taking some time off of sensory inputs. And by that, I mean, we're constantly looking at the news, checking emails, uh, checking social media, and there's just constantly noise. There's so much noise. And I mean, as a mom right now, it's, or there's noise constantly and you're worried about something. But what always helps me is reconnecting with nature. I know that's hard in New York City, but I love going for long walks and putting on some music. I have this playlist that I call Flow, and I'm not sure if you're, I mean, you're, you're a writer, so you know that you can get into states of flow. Right. in a different way. And that's when everything is aligning and your, your subconscious works and it brings you insights or creative ideas. And there's certain music that actually really helps me get into that meditative state. And so that's something I'll do, even if it's late at night, I'll put in my, my AirPods, you know, when all the girls are asleep and I'll listen to some music, I'll do some writing or in the middle of the day, if I can, I don't, I mean, sometimes I just, I'm not able to do it. I'm stuck inside in front of my computer, but if I can, I'll just go for a walk and play music or not play music and just really become present and take in my surroundings. And that knowing that I'm just a small part of something greater in the universe always takes me out of it, always takes me out of it and reminds me that the universe has my back and I'm destined for great things. That's awesome. I, I, really resonate with that because I do something quite similar. I love taking walks and sometimes it'll, I'll listen to music. And then other times what I'll do is I don't, I don't know if this is a phrase or a term, but I call it just like the capsule of my dreams mm-hmm. and I'll like take a walk and I'll kind of like start thinking, okay, like what's in this capsule that you have? Cause I've been collecting things since I've, you know, been alive. So it's eventually one day getting married, having kids, starting that chapter of my life. It's, mm-hmm. well, this was one of the things doing this podcast. So this is actually manifesting out of all mm-hmm. those walks and all these other things for my life that I see for my life. I kind of just go into that, what I call a capsule and just as I walk, mm-hmm. envision it, you know, and it kind of just puts me back right into alignment of, all this, especially if you're, and and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but especially if you're dealing with any type of comparison, like you mentioned on social media or, or, you know, seeing someone a little bit further ahead than you, um, Mm -hmm. that knocks me out of that. And I kind of get back into alignment of what it is that I really want and what's really important to me and what are my core principles. So Mm -hmm. that same tone, when you saw, when you turned on the TV and you saw, this other actress that um, that you thought at one point maybe might have been you. I think I would have then researched her probably and kind of seen, you know, what she was up to on on Instagram. That would have been my that would have been my <laughs> reaction. I don't know if you did something similar, but can you talk a little bit about that? Like, was there a kind of a comparison? Did you did you go through that whole spiral? Oh, of course I went on Instagram. I mean, that's what you do <laughs> nowadays. Um, of course, yeah, I went on and it was very cool to see how, um, not just this character, but like the whole cast, they just, their followers just skyrocketed, uh, over the course of a week. Not like I was tracking it every day, but I remember like, oh, wow, she's at 5,000. And the next day I saw a post from her and she was at like, 200,000. I was like, wow, this is so uh, fascinating. And it's hard to feel when you don't have that awareness. And at the time, I didn't have this awareness. But I was like, wow, this is really going to what's the word? People are going to value her more because she has so many followers now. And that is, I think, you know, she is very valuable. But what I'm saying is, people shouldn't be valued by the number of followers they have. 
Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't think that way at all. I know there's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's ad dollars and all that. If you want to think about the monetary side of it, fine. But when you think of someone as an artist, I don't think one people should value people by the, the amount of followers they have or not. Um, and also your value comes from how you see yourself and what you're able to give to the world. So again, I'm not commenting on the specific actors, but it's just, the nature of the industry and social media is making other people feel unworthy because they don't have a huge number next to their Instagram handle. Right. And people all often confuse to popularity with the truth of something or validation of something, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, I think that is where it gets a little bit tricky. And it, and often you could even fool yourself by seeing her numbers catapult and think, Oh man, you know, that could have been me. And you often, you, you could also trick yourself for, for like a good 24 hours there before you, before you come out of that, you know, <laughs> yeah. they call it the comparison hangover. And mm-hmm. yeah, you kind of just go through a hangover of, of like 24 hours before you like pull yourself out of it or somebody pulls yourself mm-hmm. out of it. Um, I've never heard that term comparison hangover. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kristen Bell actually talks a lot about it. She has a podcast and she talks a lot. And I thought, you know, I guess you think that if you're a big actress on, on a show too, you wouldn't deal with that. But I mean, everyone does, you know, like everyone does. So it was great for me to hear her talk about that too. Can I ask about when you were kind of going through that moment and you realize this is the moment that kind of jolted your did I make the right choice kind of debacle or narrative going on in your head? Did that put any pressure on your home life and your home relationship? Because that, I guess, is seemingly what you did choose at that time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think it was, I was definitely down. I had the comparison hangover, as you mentioned, not just one day, but a couple days. Yeah. And it was really sweet. I actually... I was sad and I allowed myself to be sad and I would have moments I would just be crying by myself. And then I saw my daughter who two at the time and I told her, I'm just really sad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, let her, I let myself cry in front of her. And she's like, it's okay, mom. Mm-hmm. Do you need a band aid? <laughs> <laughs> and then she, I said, no, I'm okay. And she gave me a big hug. She's like, there, there, mom. And this is what I said to her. It'll be okay. <laughs> uh, and I think realigning with gratitude really helps me too. And I, I will say this as much as I'm saying makes it sound like the burden of choice. I don't, I don't think it's a burden at all. I mean, I'm very grateful to have a family and I know that a lot of people wouldn't even have this choice of having a career that they're also passionate about, but with a lot of financial risk and also a family. I got a, I had a miscarriage for my first and then my second pregnancy was not such a piece of, piece of cake. So I get it. So in those moments, when I look into this beautiful human being I created who is so sweet, I know that I'm on the path I'm supposed to be right now. Yeah. And something clicked over the last several months, you know, after that show, maybe when the show, you know, ended for the season and it wasn't in my face and people weren't, you have no idea how many people texted me about the show. Like, have you seen this show? It's so amazing. Oh my gosh. You just would have been so great in that role. It was just totally up your alley. And you know, so it was kind of like in in my face for a really, really long time. Yeah. So like, thanks, guys. I know. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, everybody. But I think talking it through with people and just telling them, like, hey, I'm really sad about this. And this is why. And there are some friends that were like, well, you made that choice that you did because of reason, because of the reasons that you had, because of those reasons in the moment. So what were those reasons again? And I went through the decision process again. I'm like, Yep. I made the decision I made with the best information I had at the time and no regrets. Right. And there was something that clicked that that actress is on her path. Yeah. This is her moment to shine. And 
I've had a little bit of my moment to shine, but I believe that my bigger moment to shine is still coming. And one of my college professors once said that you can have everything you want in life, just not at the same time. And that quote has always resonated with me when I'm feeling like, oh man, I don't have that right now. Maybe whether that's in my family life or whether that's in my career. And I know that things are just coming as they come. And I don't really have, I, I can't force things to happen in my own timeline. And same with, you know, everybody else. You can't control when somebody else is going to be a success. Right. Good for them, right? That's, that's beautiful. They're on their own journey. And I know my journey is going to unfold the way it unfolds. And all I can do right now is embrace embrace the present. I can't really control the past and I can't control the future. All I can do is set myself up for success later on. Yeah, that's that's incredible. And like I said, I think you have a really good self-awareness as well to know that and to not get pulled down into the the funk and the negatives of, of that situation. The other thing I heard you say was you allowed yourself to grieve that moment as well. And as you know, the name of the podcast is how I got through it. And I think that that's a really important part of getting through something, right? You're going to have wins. You're going to have times that you don't win and allowing yourself to grieve through that moment, or even just, I think being your own best friend through that moment. (laughs) Nobody else understands how much you want this passion that you have for you. It'd be acting for other people's different things, but or that job that they really want, or that family that they really want. And going mm-hmm. through those moments where it doesn't feel so great, or you seemingly lost something, you do have to grieve those moments, you kind of have to get it out of your system. So I heard you talk about meditating, I know that you spent just days being sad. Are there other things that you do to kind of just let go or get rid of those like toxic could be feelings? <laughs> Consistently in an acting program, even when I'm working as an actor and those times when I'm not on a project and I'm just auditioning and figuring out my next move or just focusing on my kids, I still try to carve out time every week to practice. Yeah. I think like if you're a professional dancer, even when you're not putting on a show, you still, still should be practicing, right? And so I work with a teacher, a a theater program. It's been virtual for the last year because of the pandemic. But that always helps me get back in the sense that we do a lot of emotional work where we can even work out issues that we're going through in our personal life right? through different acting exercises, whether it's uh, and I, you know, I use this uh, when I was very frustrated a couple of months ago about something with regards to pregnancy and feeling angry towards another individual, so even just having a, an imaginary monologue with that person yeah. or just even, and I highly recommend this, there's different voice recorder apps, even just talking into your phone yeah. and just having a conversation, letting your thoughts. Hearing your thoughts out loud really, really help. And some people use therapists, some people talk into their phones, people, some people have friends that they can just vent to and have, you know, I even had a conversation with my friend. We're always like really, really positive. And I'm like, you know what? Let's just, let's just vent about life right now. Let's just be, allow ourselves to be completely negative and Mm -hmm. pessimistic. (laughs) And it felt, oh my gosh, it felt so good because my primary self is a very optimistic person. I always see the positive side of things and I'm always diplomatic. Even in this podcast, I'm aware I'm like, I've been like sugarcoating things. Um, <laughs> and that's just what I've led with my entire life because that's what keeps me safe. You know, that's what makes me feel safe at least. Yeah. But visiting the other side is very cathartic. It really is. And that's something I really recommend to people is just not holding your tension in, just releasing it. And that it definitely, 
it opens something up within you and allows you to move on. Right. And it sounds just in a way for you also very therapeutic, you know, and all of those things you mentioned are quite therapeutic, but this sounds like just really getting into your emotions and even just the movement. Like if you're acting and there's movement, a part of it, right? Like I think, I think really helps. Um, so now like looking back, connecting the dots in retrospect, what do you think is the thing that you learned through that experience? You know, when you look back on it, well, one, the one highlight, one highlight is definitely approaching opportunities and decisions from a place of abundance, but also from a place of love and integrity. Doing a gut check. Is this something that's giving me anxiety? Is this something that I'm not going to feel good about in five years or 10 years, whether I did or did not do it? And is it coming from a place of integrity? There's one rule that I really like to follow with any tough decision, and it's the 10, 10, 10 rule. Actually, I don't know if this is exactly the 10, 10, 10 rule, but this is the way I use it. Let's um, share. <laughs> sure, sure. I say my decision aloud, right? And then I say, how will I feel about this, this, this decision 10 minutes later? Uh-huh. 10 months later and 10 years later. Wow. Okay. So whether it's, let's see, you know, someone's like watching their diet, for example, and you're like, should I really have this pizza pizza in 10 minutes? I'll probably feel really good in 10 months, you know, maybe not in 10 years, you know, maybe it wasn't, you know, that set off a trend and maybe I'm a pattern and maybe I shouldn't have done that. Whatever. That's a, that's a really bad example. But I think about things with, with roles now, you know, when I see an audition and something shoots in Alaska for six months, will I be really happy saying yes to it? How is this going to feel in 10 minutes, 10, 10 months and 10 years? And that's a gut check for me. That's always really helped me. That's awesome. I'm going to take that. That's, that's also really good advice. Like if, like I'm moving right now. So (laughs) when I decide to move, will I be happy here in 10 months? Will I be happy here in 10 years if I decide to stay here? Like that's a really good way to kind of measure it for me too. So what do you do though, when you do decide on something and then you're working at it, you're working at it, you're working at it. It's not coming to fruition. Do you have something that you, is there a process that you measure against to say, when can I, when do I stop working hard towards this thing? Or do I keep pursuing it because I really believe in my dreams and it's coming from a place of love and integrity. And I know this is going to happen for me. Or do you just, you know, quit at that thing? Like what, when, (laughs) how do you know when to continue or when to stop? That's a really tough question. And I, I get that a lot. And it was a Everybody asked me this question when I told them I was going to leave my consulting job and go into acting. The right. question was, how long are you going to give yourself until you quit? Yes. Like, right. Uh, how long are you going to pursue this? And I was like, I don't know, a few years, five years, 10 years. I don't really know forever. I mean, I always look at from it from a place of faith. I'm not talking about religious sort of faith, but faith in yourself and yeah. practicality. So there's a difference between confidence and faith, right? Confidence is very fleeting to me, at least, you know, if you have a couple wins, you're going to feel confident going to the next thing. But if you have a loss, you're not going to feel confident the next time around. But faith is in your underbelly. And for me personally, I have had a lot of faith in what I do. And that's what keeps me going through all the thousands of rejections I've had for the course of the last 10 years and all the disappointments. I still have that faith that this is what I was meant to do and I'm going to do it. Now, I don't know how much people have faith and and conviction in what they do and what they want to do. Right. And I can't tell someone if what I can't assess what their financial risks are too, because pursuing your passion is amazing if you can do it and you can support yourself doing it. But a lot of people aren't able to do that. So I'm not the one to advise like, oh, when you run out of money or if somebody's just told you no so many times, it really depends on the situation. But all I do know is you have to listen to yourself and you have to know how badly you want it. And 
if you want it and you're okay with the rejection and you can find a way to support yourself, then maybe that's a great sign. If the financial factors, if the financial risk isn't worth it, if you're unhappy and you don't love the journey, then maybe think otherwise. But I love the journey and the rejection is hard, but I've learned to have really thick skin throughout it. And it's a challenge to me. It's, it's not a problem. The rejection isn't a problem for me. It's a, it's a challenge. And I've learned to reframe it, reframe it as such and just keep going back to that faith I have. And I know I'm going to keep going. Like I don't have a, a plan B. I don't. I mean, I could probably figure out if I wanted to, but I, I don't want to right now. And so you have to really think about those factors. If you're, you know, yeah, you, should, you know, if you have, have faith, I, I mean, you shouldn't really be asking you, yourself that question. Right. And you have to know where your faith comes from. And, and like you mentioned, like if it's faith or if it's just confidence, because I, I agree with you actually. And I never thought about it in that way that confidence can be a very short term, um, mm-hmm. short term feeling, um, that you have, um, that catapults you into the next thing, but, Faith is is very long term and it, it doesn't waver as much, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess this leads me to ask about your strength because you said that you realize that you have thick skin or you gained thick skin through this, through all the rejection on this journey. What do you think are the other strengths that this journey has evoked from you that you didn't so- know? You- yeah. So, so definitely the resistant there, the, sorry, the resilience, the persistence being sitting with failure or sitting with losing and being uncomfortable. I think I've really learned how to be uncomfortable. Oftentimes we run away from discomfort. And I would say I've done that for most of my life. I've only pursue things that I was really good at because I didn't want to be heard told no. But I'll be honest, when I started acting, I didn't know anything. In my first couple acting classes, my first acting class, the teacher was like, what is that? That's not acting. You don't know what you're doing. And I was really disheartened. And I didn't go back to that acting teacher. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was scared. And But I kept going and I kept learning. And I've learned to just be okay not being the best, but there's this hunger that I'm going to be the best I can be. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's something I've, I've learned and I've really matured. It's okay. It's okay to be disappointed. It's okay to not be good at times. It's okay to be uncomfortable, right? It's okay to hurt, feel sad, feel pain, even sit with yourself in that. And then when it's out of your system, move on. Yeah. And know that even though you have those feelings, you're, you're human and you are worthy. You are worthy of success. Yeah. And I know that we're talking a lot about this in the acting context, but I really do feel like all of this is universal, right? Like this is something that I deal with, you know, like sitting with rejection and sitting with sadness on a day to day, especially in New York City. It's like such a beautiful, vibrant city. And there's so many people, but you could also still feel very alone, very isolated. And I think we just kind of all felt that with the pandemic, you know, um, and learning how to just be with yourself, you know, through all of the human emotions that you go through on this journey in this lifetime. Like, I think that's one of the most valuable things that I I hear you saying, and that is very, very universal. And so, as a woman in your thirties and going through this journey, what do you think is the best advice that you've received? And then also to flip that, what, what would you tell someone um, if they were on this journey as a young actress or actor? Mm-hmm. So as we come full circle with the, the concept of career versus family and what do you do? I've gotten two different pieces of advice and I'll let you know what I'm leaning toward, but two women that are not actors, but they're on, um, I would say the management side of acting. And so they know uh, of talent. So they know talent, they know executives, they know the business side of it. And one, and I respect both greatly. One of them said, go where your heart is and career will 
career will follow. So mm-hmm. follow the love in your life and your career will follow, right? And so you can interpret that in many ways, whether it's moving to a different city to be with your significant other, if it's to have kids at this stage in your career. And then another woman I spoke to who's very successful as well. She says, Melanie, you know, exceptional people do exceptional things. So if that means moving mountains, it means going after everything. It means making it work with your family. And I appreciate that as well. But then I ask her, you know, the women, you know, that are pushing aside family or maybe trying to make it work, but the family is suffering or they're in a relationship and they took an opportunity where they have to be away from their significant other. Like what is happening? How is that working out? She says they're lonely or it's hard. Yeah. Right. So it's this constant battle of how will you feel personally feel, are you going to feel lonely if you're just focusing on career right now or you're putting family aside or if you're just focusing on family and pushing these career options aside, are you going to feel like you're, you're missing out and made the right or wrong decision? And so I'm leaning towards, and again, I don't know if it's right or not. We won't know that until we're on our deathbed, (laughs) but I'm, I'm leaning towards going where the love is in your life and career will follow. And I've, I've had moments in my life that have in which case pursuing something from that viewpoint has worked out for the better, but we will always be asking ourselves the what if, but for me, it's going, coming from a place of love and, and focus and hard work, of course, And then the opportunities will come, will manifest as they're supposed to. Yeah, I agree with that. And I've done both too. I've done gone and took actions based on fear because I thought I should do this. And then I've taken Mm -hmm. it based on love because I just love to do this thing. And the, the feeling is completely different in each of them. And then the after feeling is also very different in each of them. (laughs) And I think the after feeling a lot has, has what allowed me to know that love is actually a a better path for me as well. So I I echo your sentiments there. Mm -hmm. Uh, 10 years from now, what do you think that you would want us to know about Melanie? Well, if you could see her 10 years from now, what would you hope that she'd be doing? What kind of journey do you, do you hope that she'd be on Tell us a little bit about that version of Melanie that you <laughs> your heart somewhere. Uh huh. Um, I'm still wearing skinny jeans and like a gray or white t-shirt and boots. Um, <laughs> no matter where I'm living in life, like the New York style is always going to be there. And I'm surrounded by my, my two daughters who are a little bit more grown up right now. They're, um, One's four months old, the other one is three. And they're going to be cheering their mom on. They're going to be so proud of her for the work she's doing in front of the camera and behind the camera. And, you know, I just want them to be proud. I hope that the work that I'm working on right now, some things that I'm not able to talk about, but I've been working on for years and hopefully they'll manifest soon. I hope that it will allow them as brown women to live in a more accepting world. And that's what I, you know, it's something that fuels me. I want my, I want to be proud with the work I've done to elevate women and women of color in front of and behind the, and behind the camera is something you and I've talked about many years ago. Yes, yes. Um, it's, it's just the journey. Everything takes a long time, but I'm working on it and I want, to make the world a better place for them too. So yeah, I have this like image of them just celebrating my journey, all of us celebrating it together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really, really beautiful. And I can actually see that for you too. And I, you're on that path. I mean, like you mentioned, we talked about it a couple of years ago and I think even after going through, you know, everything we all went through in 2020, it's even fueled more now. You know, our passions have come out more and have come more to the surface. And the last question that I'll, I'll wrap up with is taking into consideration your entire journey, your 
being a mom, an actress, um, even when you were a consultant at McKinsey, everything, your entire journey all together and now being a parent and, and being a, a married woman as well and, and a wife and a, a mother and a daughter, what has been the highlight of your life so far? It's a good question. <laughs> oh, wow. There's, I mean, gosh, there's two. I mean, it's hard to pick one. I'm so sorry. It's really hard to pick one. I think, well, a finding, finding love in my life. Uh, my husband. Yeah. He's definitely a highlight. Um, booking, you know, my first big television role, also a huge highlight, uh, or at least my first serious regular role. That was a super, it was a great highlight, you know, getting pregnant with my first and then, you know, having my second. And then I think, the real highlight, I think another highlight is hopefully on its way in the next year, but I know that did not answer your question, but it's just so hard. <laughs> no, um, it's a mark of a, a life well lived so far also. <laughs> and then I hope to hear like, you know, your next big thing that you, you've got going on, but thank you so much for spending your time with me today and, and kind of navigating that situation where, you know, you kind of endured a loss, what, what felt like a loss. You had to make a decision and, and how you navigated through that and really how you got through it. I think I got, I got personally like a lot out of this conversation. I know everyone else will as well. Um, and if people want to follow you or follow your journey, where can they find you? I think Instagram is a great place. Uh, you know, once I started, uh, it's just at Melanie Chandra. I used to be on Facebook and Twitter, but honestly, when uh, after the birth of my second daughter, it's just really hard to to do all that. So I'm just I just chose one platform platform, and that's Instagram that I try to update ever so frequently. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken a break though. I know I get I'll it. Be, I'll, I'll be back on. So I'll put it in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for spending your time with me today. Have a great rest of the day, and we'll talk soon. I'll see you on the okay. street somewhere. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.